Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. This show is brought to you by Flatiron's Tuning, your source for any aftermarket or OEM Subaru parts. Be sure to check out our store at flatironstuning.com and stay tuned with Flatiron's Tuning. Welcome back, everybody, to the Flatiron Syndicate Podcast. I am here today with a special guest. We are sitting here with James Hudson, uh, a.k.a. Uh, Gator, or I think on NASIAC, was it Sergeant Gator? Yep. Yep. And, and James, the reason I, I had to reach out to you is because I had this kind of thought come across because you you do endurance racing with Subarus. And you have recently done, uh, had done a, I think it was an eight-hour enduro in Oregon. Is that right? A recently? couple of them, yes. And, and you, you actually won your class. You had some really good success with that. And I realized, well, wait a minute. You're out there endurance racing a Subaru and having success with it. Like you're not just out there participating. You're actually starting to to get a, a good uh, history of, of positive results with these cars in probably what is one of the most extreme conditions that you can race these cars in. But at the same time, there's been a lot of discussion of late about how Subarus are unreliable and that sort of thing. And not to say that endurance racing is easy because I can't think of really many other people that are out there doing it and having success the level that you are short of maybe SCI themselves with the uh, 24 hour Nürburgring race. Um, This doesn't always finish either. Correct. (laughs) I mean, there's, when you're running a race that that's, that's that long, so many things can happen, but I realized that I, I really needed to reach out to you and just see if we could sit down and have a conversation about how you're doing this thing. You're, you're basically doing the impossible. It would seem endurance racing Subarus and having success with it. So that was, that was my motivation. (laughs) You're not the only and, person that thinks that. Well, that's good. And, <laughs> and, and thankfully, thankfully, you're willing to, to sit down and have a conversation. So I'm very I'm excited. Happy to. I'm happy to. I'm, so I'm, I'm sponsored by Subaru of Bend, the, mm-hmm. the oldest Subaru dealership on the West Coast. And so I'm happy to support them and support Subaru in general and, and get the word out there that you can race a Subaru for longer than a five-minute time attack. Yeah. It is possible. It's not easy, but definitely possible. And that's, yes. that's what I wanted to pick your brain about. Um, I guess my first question is, how did you find endurance racing? Because it is it is so different in, in the challenge of an endurance race. And, and again, we're talking about multiple hours here for, for a lot of these events. Right. It's, a, it's a kind of a different, a different challenge. So how did, that, how did you first find that? How did it grab you? Well, I, actually, it goes all the way back to the days of Chump Car which if you're familiar on the mm-hmm. West coast, chump car has eventually morphed more or less into lucky dog. Mm-hmm. It's the same uh, gal runs. It came over from chump car and she started lucky dog. So I did a chump car race way back in 2012. I think it was with some friends in 2013 in a, in an old Nissan. And I mean, it was, it was bad, but it was fun. And so that was the, that was my introduction to endurance racing, but most of my time has been spent doing sprint racing where the races are 30 minutes. Typically, um, over a weekend, there'll be two or three or four races at 30 minutes a piece. And then the, uh, the series I run in the international conference of sports car clubs, it's a Oregon, Washington, British Columbia group of of sports car clubs that get together and have this conference racing. Okay. Um, we also have one hour, what we call mini enduros. So you can go out there and do a 30 minute sprint race, and then you can do a one hour mini enduro also the same day. And that's fun. And I learned mm-hmm. a lot from doing the one hour mini enduros. And then they also sponsor these eight hour uh, endurance races at the, usually in October every year. And they've been doing it for, 47 years at the Portland International oh, Raceway. Okay. And it's a Le Mans start. It's the last Le Mans start that we're of, uh, we're Amer- uh, aware of in North America. It's Where really we have, cool. You have to actually run to the car. Like the you start, you're the out car, of the car. You jump in, you put all the straps on yeah. and try to get going. And I'm usually about the last one out because I'm really, I don't like to go out with all my straps undone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and of course, that's a big violation. But anyway, I'm sure. not very fast at it. Sure. Um, it, but it's a blast. And then that's an eight-hour race. Okay. Uh, I haven't I've been to some 25, the Thunder Hill 25 as a spectator. I've never actually driven it or crew chiefed it. 
And as an owner, I probably wouldn't at this mm. point. I had a big goal of doing the 25 hour. I really wanted to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably do it as a driver, hopefully next two or three years. Okay. But I'm not going to go down there as an owner and m- try to manage a team for the 25 hours because that's just, I'm too is, old for that. Is that because now that, I mean, you're doing these eight hour events and, and that's basically three eight hour events back to back more or less. I mean, is it just because you, you know, now what's involved with the eight hour event and, right. and stretching it out just. And, and the budget, I mean, mm. one 25 hour race is about an entire season's budget. Wow. For regular racing, like 30 minute sprint racing weekends. Other than okay. the cost of all the different toes you have to do, you know, tow bill, right. tow costs are huge, but yeah, but just the amount of gas tires, brake pads, all that stuff. It's about almost a whole season. Con- consumables add up at that point. <laughs> you're, you're consuming them at a, at a very rapid rate. So I, I imagine that the bill yes. is not something that you can just kind of yes. ignore. So I have to go with somebody else's team. Uh, and it probably wouldn't even be in a Subaru. It could okay. be, but it probably wouldn't be. Yeah. And, and just go do it. But otherwise I do the eight hour. I do the, I love doing the eight hour cascade race because it's a morning and evening race. Mm-hmm. We go into the night and that's fun. If you've never raced at night, if you've never raced at night and in the rain, oh man, there's nothing like that. It is, it is a challenge. Some of the most stressful driving you'll imagine doing. Well, but but it seems like you enjoy that part of it. Oh, I love it because yeah. the Subarus just kick ass mm. in the rain. <laughs> oh, for sure. Okay. Every time I go to a race, I pray for rain. Sure. I used to have that on my car, praying yeah. for rain. <laughs> Good, good name for a Subaru race team. Yeah, it would yeah. be a good name for a, like a lucky dog Subaru race team, especially. Yeah, for sure. Well, let me ask you just with all your experience, because you've, you've raced a few different Subaru platforms. So let's let's maybe yep. just start with what platforms you've, you've raced so far. And I, I think they're all fairly similar, but maybe, maybe I'm missing one. They are similar uh, in a lot of ways. I started with a former Can-Am car that was raced by Phoenix Performance. Mm -hmm. They did the prep, and it was the Subaru Road Race team car. You may or may not remember, but back in the early 2000s, the Subaru Subaru North America sponsored an actual road race team for Mm -hmm. a few years. And it was one of their cars that they raced in the Can-Am Cup. It was a legacy GT wagon. it's still out there. I've, I've just contacted the new owner oh, yeah. since I, since it passed out of my hands and they are excited to get it back on the track. So I sent them a bunch of historical photos about, you know, before I got it, then when I got it and now they understand how, what's going on with the car. Oh, so yeah. that was a very cool car. Um, I did that for a couple of years and then I, um, and all of this was because I wanted to build a factory five, eight, one, eight, which is a Subaru okay. powered platform. Right. Yep. Um, and I, when I saw how it was going with Factory 5 in the, when they first came out in 2013, it was clearly going to be, if you bought the first models, the first kits that came out, you were going to be a pioneer. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Kit, cars a lot of trailblazing. Are, kit cars are hard, period, because you have to do a ton of fabrication work, no matter what the kit car company says. And then when you get one that's their first version of it, yeah, it, it's a learning experience for everybody. And so I backed off on that. For a couple of years, raced the wagon. Then the wagon uh, blew. I went through two engines at Pacific Raceways, the same place on the track two oh, years no. in a row. Wow! <laughs> and uh, and the second time that the engine blew, they towed me back into the you know, the paddock. And a guy that had wanted to own that car since he used to be a fan of Can Am racing, mm. uh, of Grand Am racing, I mean, came over and said, "I'll buy it the way it is." blown engine just leave it here in the paddock and i'll tow it away later oh man I, you got a deal because <laughs> i at that point i was so Touch at the right moment yeah uh, yeah and then i walked over and bought the sti which was for sale okay. on the other side of the parking lot from uh, another friend of mine that i'd known he'd been okay. racing it in conference and he wanted to sell his and go specky 46 hmm. so um, i bought his sti and that's the car i still have today and still race today, along with the Factory 5818. I ended up getting one of those too. So right now, okay. I currently have a Factory 5818 that's got an EJ257, 
five-speed transmission. I've got an STI EJ257, six-speed transmission. And I've just, over the last year, rebuilt a BRZ oh. to go race in T4. Um, okay. In the conference version of T4, SCCA T4, International Conference Sports Car Club, CT4. That's, so and I'm, that, I'm that really looking had, forward to that. That car's had a, a decent amount of success in, in T4. So that should be fun. Yeah. It did. It was, it's a tech, it's a former tech sports car racing that they raced in the Pirelli world challenge. Okay. And they won three years. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. That, that's and the a, TCA America cup. Good, good start. Good. Uh, as good a starting point as any, I would say. Uh, yeah. It needed a lot of work. When you take a car that's been professionally raced for sure. three or four years, you basically are starting all over from the beginning. Oh man. <laughs> well, well, hopefully it was at least pretty much straight. Sometimes, sometimes that's yeah. not. It wasn't. Oh boy, oh <laughs> it's boy. okay. It's okay. all fixed now. All fixed now. Well, yeah. and we should just jump back real quick and just for anybody listening or watching that doesn't know what the eight one eight car that we're talking about. That's the factory five kit car, where you take basically a Subaru engine and drivetrain, and you take the engine from being in the front of the car basically to a mid engine position with the same transmission driving the rear wheels that would normally drive the front. So it's a lot right. lighter but it's a rear wheel drive uh, kit car with that super engine and, and power plant. So um, yeah, you, you basically take an Impreza or WRX or STI mm -hmm. and you take the engine out of the front and put it in the middle. Yeah. And now you've got a rear wheel drive mid engine sports car. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing just based on the weight and kind of the build of that car, that that's probably a fair amount different versus like the legacy and the STI that you've driven. Completely different. Yeah. And then yeah. any similarities to the BRZ or is the BRZ kind of its own thing? Uh, the BRZ is a, you know, it's a classic sports car. Mm. It, it, it really does drive like a sports car, or like a Miata or any other. It's still front engine, front weight heavy, mm -hmm. excuse me, but it's a, it, it doesn't drive like either, either any of those. Yeah. It's okay. It's it's a low power, very low power. I mean, to race in T4, people complain about, you know, 20 first gen BRZs being low power. Mm -hmm. Well, to race in T4, they make you put a, a throttle restrictor plate on it. Oh man. And they make you add ballast and run these little skinny tires, little seven inch wide wheels. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all part I mean, of the balancer power. Yeah, the the T4. Uh, another uh, guest we've had on a few times, Mike Pettiford, is he's been racing in SCCA for a number of years, and T4 is one of the classes that he's raced in, and he's told me some stories about like classing and the, some of the challenges they're in in that. But yeah. I mean, it's it's a good platform. It, it's relatively versatile, and, and hopefully, it works out well for you. Well, the consumables will be a lot less I than bet. running in an unlimited class STI. I bet. <laughs> Well, and and so let's let's dive into this some of the problems that you had at endurance racing because one of the one of the inspirations for me to reach out is is kind of the realization that because of the environment of an endurance race where you're racing for such a long period of time, my guess is that you can't really ignore any trouble areas. Like we can get away with in like a twenty minute, even maybe a thirty minute track session. You can kind of push things right to their limit and kind of hold them there, maybe over like over on the cooling system a little bit, but it's not going to cause any critical damage because you're just doing it probably for a short amount of time. And then you, you come out, you're done. You, you can cool the car down. But when you're going for hours at a time, like you, you can't have any weak areas like that. Was that, no, was that one of can't. the first things that you had to address? Uh. Well, it's all combined. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I think I've blown an engine every way you can do it at this point. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> so there's, but the, the, the first thing you have to always worry about is heat management mm. and it, you've got to, if it can be cooled, you have to cool it. So oil, uh, coolant, water, the differential, the transmission, the power steering, all those things will fail if you mm. don't put coolers on them. And that's, I'm guessing that's a lesson you learned from experience. Uh, yeah. 
yeah the hard way <laughs> yeah it yeah it's one of those i you know you think about like to drive a car at speed for an hour i mean i'm sure you know brakes brakes are just as big a part of that as anything brakes, i mean yeah. it's, it's like every every system because like with a 20 minute session you're kind of you're starting off cold you're getting everything warm you're kind of getting up into its peak operating area and then right as it starts to peak or maybe over on slightly you're now pulling over. down and you're done yeah. whereas you're you're just kind of getting up there into that peak operating and you're just you're just sitting there for days so yeah, exactly and i should mention it just dawned on me that uh worth a shout out to you because you're the person that reached out to me about our cooling issues the pikes Peak car and tipped me off towards this whole difference of the radiator caps the right. the the uh one way versus the two-way radiator caps I'm, I'm guessing that that's that's a lesson that you learned also yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and a critical that's... one so so thank you for that and if you guys haven't seen that video definitely worth going and checking out because that is a key detail for how the super cooling system works for sure right yeah the the ears the radiator cap with the ears goes yeah. on the expansion tank and the radiator cap with no ears goes on the radiator i don't care how mishimoto or koyo rad or yeah. csf radiator or you know any of the other ones come you've got to put that round cap on the radiator and yeah. put the other ones on the expansion tank yeah because if you, it will not function properly if you don't do that and it's and it like it is a critical function difference yes and as long as we're talking about radiator let's i got yeah. maybe we should just dive right on into that yeah um so i don't think there's any reason to use aftermarket radiator caps i run just the stock ones and i run them for eight hours and i'm running as hard as my car can run yeah so i i don't see a point in running up a higher pressure cap uh yeah it probably does make it a little more efficient but my my coolant runs at you know 190 degrees all all day long in 100 degree weather it's not an issue yeah and the real key to that that a lot of people don't want to spend the time fixing is the ducting into the radiator yeah I don't, I, I was thinking about this today. I don't know if you have to go to a special racing radiator necessarily, other than the fact you don't want to use the, the OEM radiators with the plastic end tanks. So those are going to fail, right? Yeah. But as long as you've got a decent aluminum radiator, the main thing is the ducting into the radiator and sealing around all the sides. Any place that the air is coming in can get around that radiator, it will. Yep. And it'll, it, but once you get it all going through the radiator, you're good. It's, it's an amazing, and of course I have a vented hood. That's the second part That's, of it. Is yep. That air has got to have a place to go. So it's, you know, you want to put your vent on the hood as close to the front as you can really get it because that's where the lowest pressure is and sucking it out. And just the kind of the rule yeah. of thumb is anywhere you can put a cooler where it's got high pressure air in front of it and low pressure air behind it. You probably don't even need a fan because mm. at race speeds, the fans just getting in the way and slowing down the airflow. It's just another obstruction. Yeah. Um, the only time I ever need a fan is when I'm sitting when the race is over and I'm sitting in the in the scale line to yeah. scale the car. That's where you need the fan. <laughs> but yeah. Out on the racetrack, no, nah, you don't need a you don't need fans on your radiator. It goes just fine. Yeah. Airflow is. I mean, the the setup it. They go hand in hand. You have to have the right configuration of parts. Like the caps, again, is such a critical component. Right. But but the airflow is the other. That that's the thing where I think, especially with radiators, people people can lose it. I mean, the 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 two most common mistakes that that we made, that other people have made, and I've seen, especially uh, beginning track guys make a bunch, is they take out the air conditioning. Right. which is fine. But the thing you have to remember is that AC condenser is designed to sit in front of the radiator and to seal to the radiator. So that's kind of the, this piece that, that gives you the sealing from the factory to make sure that that air that comes in goes through the condenser and then the radiator. You take that condenser out. We, I mean, when we realized we had done this, we had basically a one inch gap on either right. side of the radiator because that exactly. piece was missing. So then any of the air, it's just going to follow the path of least resistance and it's just going to skirt around the radiator, not go through it to give you the cooling. 
the other the other very common mistake I've seen, mainly with people that switch to front mounts, is they leave the regular scoop on the hood, but with nothing behind it. And the right. problem is when you have no resistance to basically no resistance to that there that the scoop is is grabbing and putting into the into the engine bay, it's pulling in a whole lot of air, and it you can actually build up positive pressure in the engine bay because of that, which actually prevents air or slows down the air from moving through the radiator to get to that cooling. It not only slows it down, it actually blows out the front in reverse. I, can. I yeah. think I sent you a picture or um, I will send you a picture of okay. when I took my 2005 STI out, you know, and they had the big hood scoop on them. Mm -hmm. And I, I went running around Oregon Raceway Park and I had put um, wool tufts all across oh, yeah. the front. Yep to the intake of the radiator and above 70 miles an hour, the wool tufts would go back like this. The oh air was gosh. coming out the wrong way. Oh man. So I knew right away, on. this is not going to work. No. Yeah. That's the, the extraction hood. I mean, that's, you, you, you've got to think about how the air is going to flow. And then like the testing, the wool tufts, like it's, it's an old school method, but it works. It works like it, it can, it can tell you a lot of really useful information and that, yeah, if, if you have that situation going on, you don't know it. And what's I sweet mean, with that now is you can get a GoPro camera with a suction mount, stick yeah. it on there and you can record these tufts at different speeds because yep. what you think is working fine at 30 miles an hour is not the same as going 80 or 90 or hundred miles an hour. Everything yeah. sometimes just completely reverses. And yeah. that's what happened with the, with the hood scoop. It was overpowering normal high pressure in front wow. of the radiator. And so, yes, I got rid of the scoop, blocked it off and everything. And of course, did all the ducting and all of a sudden no more coolant problems. Right. Yeah. It's the super cooling systems, generally speaking, are pretty well designed and overbuilt from the factory. But you go in there right. and you start modifying some of the design in these ways that you wouldn't necessarily think of right off the bat. And, and that's where you can run into all of these cooling problems or you can you can easily run into cooling problems and you're not going to sort it all out i mean we're, we're the example of that we tried everything under the sun and and what ultimately was getting us was the caps but we had the ducting eventually and, the, and like the fancy radiator corn and stuff but it without the radiator caps functioning it didn't work and you know if we had the radiator caps functioning properly but we didn't have the ducting that wouldn't work either you've got it you've got to have all right. the pieces of the puzzle working together and what I yeah. tell people thing about the radiator caps is it may not solve your overheating problem, but if you don't get that straight to start with, you'll, you can just spend a ginormous amount of money putting in different radiators and putting in different cooling systems yeah. and trying to figure out when all it was, was you just need to change the caps around. Yep. You just, you got them backwards. That's all it was. So is your car running yeah. good now? Is it, is all it's that fixed? The best, better than it's ever run before. Like we, oh, cool. we, were, we did some testing in uh, 95 degree weather earlier this year and the coolant temps never got over 206. There you um, go. I mean, it's, it's, it was, it's a mind blowing difference. And the, the key reminder there is if you're trying to evaluate a system or work on a system or improve a system, you can't really get a, you can't really figure out if you're making a difference until you ensure that the system is working properly from the beginning. Right. The baseline and, and the don't baseline. change more than one thing at a time. Yeah. How many times have you heard that? Don't make five mods and go back out to the track and see how they work. Do you one. Know, it, it's good advice that we've given good advice that we've got. And it's as true today as it probably ever will it. be. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. still ignore it because you yeah. still think I'll oh, just do these three things. It'll fix yep. it. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, it's, I think with an endurance race car, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you went down that path yourself at some point or maybe multiple times. You, you kind of think you've got a picture of what's going on, what the problem right. is. And then you can extrapolate from that and like, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Um, it's, we all want to, we all want to solve the problem. And, right. and there's, there's a temptation to throw everything at the solution, you know, and, exactly. And there's, and it, including that can money, make sense. <laughs> including money. Sure. And there's, it feels like it makes sense, but it's, it's, there's, there's something about being that um, methodical in, in the testing and, and one thing at a time, like that's how you're really going to ensure that at the end, wherever you get to the end point where right. it actually works, you're going to get there in the most efficient way. Right. Yeah. You know, Great. 
this makes it makes me think of something that I have to ask about, or I want you to I want you to tell more about this. I in, in getting ready for this, I was going back and I saw another radiator problem that you had that I had not heard of before, which was an electrolysis issue with the radiator. Yes. And c- can you explain what that was and what was going on with that? Yeah. So uh, the STI, the basically the first time I took it racing out at Spokane County Raceway, blew the engine. Okay. And, well, I went to fix it all this white goo was coming out of everywhere inside the engine, out of the coolant system, out of the radiator, out of the heater core. I mean, it was thick gobs of whitish goo. Hmm. And I I knew this has to be electrolysis. And I I just hadn't, it, it took me a while to figure it out. But then if you go to like, I think Koyo Red and Mitch Mishimoto and definitely CSF and Ron Davis and all these other mm-hmm. radiator companies, they all have a big warning on their websites about, you know, avoid electrolysis okay. and what you need to do. So what happened on mine was um, the previous owner of the STI, I bought it used, right? Mm-hmm. They had put a, a coolant temperature sensor in the radiator okay and, okay so they're getting they're trying to measure the and a lot of people will do something like they will put it at the beginning of the radiator and they'll put it on the other end of the radiator so they can get the differential and get all this data and stuff well i had one in the radiator unfortunately the wire that went to that to provide a ground to that sensor it broke inside the little um the, the basically where it attaches, but you couldn't see uh, it from the, the outside. The, the, the fitting of the sensor. Yeah, it it the little wire snapped inside the connector, but mm. you couldn't see it from the outside. But when I finally took it apart, I go, oh, well, the, it's not even grounded. So how does okay. it ground? The power is coming into the sensor, and then it's grounding through the coolant back into the engine through the oh. to the block back okay. to the alternator oh, so the, wow. gr- the coolant becomes the ground okay when the coolant becomes the ground really bad things happen with aluminum engines and aluminum oh, no. radiators <laughs> right because now you're you're including that aluminum in the ground the circuit. electrolysis goes crazy and this wow. engine was basically almost new it wow. only had a few hours on the track and it was already so gooed up. It, it, the engine would have failed if it wasn't, I think it failed for other reasons, but it would have failed for, because of that, um, for that's sure. That's crazy. That, that's one of those, like, you see a lot of the, a lot of times the sensors, the fittings I see for the sensors is to put it inside the hose, like a hose adapter. Yes. And, and I think that's probably a little bit better but no, that's a bad idea too. You don't like that one? Okay. No, I don't want I want it to be in the block. Oh, okay. Where where the that way the ground is. is actually going to go through the block back to the battery and the alternator. Okay. And there's sure. no chance it's going to go through the coolant then. Sure. And of course okay. the radiator is isolated from everything itself because it's got the rubber grommets that's why they use rubber grommets on the bottom of the radiator you don't just solid mount it it's it's partly because the shake but it's also because it's not electrically connected now to your car gotcha and it with the engine block because of the engine grounds the ground it's uh, the engine block itself is grounded so that if you're putting the sensor on there it's okay yeah that's uh that's a really good piece of information to to kind of just file away the, yeah, there's, I'll save you about ten thousand dollars in a race engine. <laughs> there you go. That that's got to be one of these things that, like, you never like really helpful information that you never thought you would need to know, but then there it is. Yeah. And it when you when you run it through that way, it makes total sense. Right. But until you run into it like that, it would probably never dawn on you that that actually the position of the sensor in in the cooling system or in the engine or whatever is actually something where there really is some thought that could go into it that that could. And I think that warning is actually printed on the Koyo red box that the radiator comes in. Okay. I think, I I think I cut that out. I could give it to you to add as a picture later. I've got a couple boxes here. I basically says, (laughs) yes. 
Uh, if it's if it's on the box, I'll put it up in the podcast. You'll be looking at it right now. It's <laughs> it's one of those, you know, read the instructions and that's the first thing that yeah, we throw yeah. out. But it's like, oh, well, there's, it's there's like actually the instruction. Some good stuff. <laughs> it's like the instruction that comes with the machine motor radiator. It tells you do not use the machine motor radiator cap. Right. <laughs> or the Subaru. Yep. yep. <laughs> Who yep. reads that? Who reads that? Yeah. That's the thing that I still to this day have never understood is that they ship the radiators with the caps on the radiator. <laughs> So that like just the natural instinct is like this is how it's it came, this is how it should be. But then yeah, the fine print is like, yeah, don't do this. Like, why yeah. do you ship it that way if that's not who knows? But, but there you go. <laughs> there you go. That's okay. One of those so things. I think we've right? covered radiators now. Yes, yes. What are the what are what were some of the other systems that that you then ran into issues with or or that you think would be like if you're building this new car or, or shaking down this new car, the critical systems that you would test? Well, well, let's just, I'm thinking that we should back up just a little bit um, and talk about the heat management again Mm. and the criticality of not having too much heat in the engine that you're intentionally trying to produce that heat. What I mean by that is horsepower is nothing more than converting chemicals into heat, right? Mm Mm-hmm. The more chemicals you convert into heat, the more horsepower you get. And I've got this Gator's rule of thumb on this subject. And that is if you want an engine to run for eight straight hours or even two straight hours or even one straight hour, you have to consider that that heat, that engine becomes a sump for heat and it's got to dissipate that heat, Mm -hmm. right? Well, if you're dissipating the heat through four cylinders, or are you just paying the heat through six cylinders or eight cylinders? Because each cylinder has a cooling jacket. Mm-hmm. Each cylinder has its own, uh, you know, bearings and oil flow and all that stuff. So it's just, it's just common sense when you think about it, that a V8 engine that's got, say, 400 horsepower and a Subaru four-cylinder engine has got 400 horsepower, the V8 is far less stressed mm-hmm. because... I mean, it's not just the power of the actual piston, but it's the heat it has to get rid of. The V8 has twice as much cooling. The the V8 has more oil uh, places. The oil going through the bearings doesn't have to absorb so much heat. The whole nine yards. So I've come up with this formula, which is probably might be controversial, but this is the way I look at it. That's right. You want an engine to last... um, really reliably for a track day car. You want your car to go out and just do track day, track day, track day, not have to worry about stuff. Keep it about 50 horsepower per cylinder. So in our cars, that's a 200 horsepower engine in our Subarus. Uh, In a Corvette, you're talking 400 horsepower. Sure. Right. So a 400 horsepower Corvette can go all day long at the track. And a 200 horsepower Subaru can too. Well, then the the next step up from that in my rule of thumb is 75 Mm -hmm. horsepower per cylinder. And that's the edge of Mm -hmm. reliability for any kind of driving more than 30 minutes. So in our cars, it's 300 horsepower, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, and if you're running in um, uh, an eight cylinder or six, uh, six cylinder at 75 horsepower, that's about 450. And that's about the edge of mm-hmm. being able to run, consider you know, doing any kind of endurance racing. You get above that and it gets dicey. So at 100 horsepower per cylinder, which in the Subaru world is only 400 horsepower, and people think, yeah. oh, any Subaru can make 400 horsepower, right? Well, think about it. In a C6R Corvette, they could run 800 horsepower, but they don't. At Le Mans, yeah. The C6Rs with the LS7 engine, they were running 470 horsepower in the GT2 car, and the GT1 car is about 670. Well, even at 670 horsepower, that's still only 84 horsepower per cylinder, which is less than a lot of guys are trying to run yeah. their 400 horsepower Subaru. But that's what you got to do if you want the engine to last for 24 hours at Le Mans. And if, if you go back and even look at the 1971 Porsche 917K, probably mm-hmm. the most legendary car of all time, 12 cylinders, five yep. liters, 650 horsepower. 
that's 55 horsepower per cylinder. Yeah. And, and I mean, how many people those days, think of it that a 917 Porsche is only making 55 horsepower per cylinder? Well, and, and back in those days, that was not a small amount. But that's also why they went to so much displacement and so many cylinders, because they knew that the, the, the engines had to be reliable. Right. And reason, and they were getting that reliability by adding the displacement, adding the cylinders, and then basically not having to stress the engine as much right. to to get that performance out of it. Because when you're, yeah, the the it, it's funny. I remember, I remember early days, 400 horsepower STI. Like this is 2003, four, five, six, 400 horsepower STI. That was not that common. It was it was relatively hard to do a lot of people right. blew up a lot of cars trying to get to that number and right. now we've learned a lot we, we've learned a lot the parts that we have access to are way better than they ever were back then uh, the tuning options are significantly better than what we had back then and, and it's almost like 400 horsepower is academic and so it's it's bolt ones it's just simple bolt-ons it, there's simple proven paths to get to that number and it makes it seem like it's easily attainable. But the thing that you forget is how much stress to the system are you adding by just going up to that point? Even though right. you can add these parts and you know that you're going to get to this point, to think about the stress to the engine, to the cooling system, to all the other systems of the engine, you're adding all this power, you're adding all this heat load. How? Yeah. What are you doing to control that? And in, in the community, you'll go in there on Maziac or you know Iwisty, or any of the other forums out there. And there's guys saying, oh, I've been running 650 horsepower in my street car for five years. It's never blown up. It's never had a problem. It runs great. Well, if you've got 650 horsepower in STI and you punch it, how long is it before you're going over 100 miles an hour? Yeah. <laughs> Not very Not long. long, a few seconds. Yeah. Now go out there and try and run it at, at that power for an hour on the freeway and let's see how it goes. Heck, heck, even if you're not in jail, minutes, which you will yeah. be, right, right. Um, you're you're going to blow the engine up. There's just no doubt about it. You're, everything's going to start melting. Yeah, stuff's going to start failing. It's just the way it is because it's just a ginormous amount of heat that you're, you're the, all the other systems are not ready to to handle. Yep. For more than you know a few pulls or a time attack or something. Yeah, it's with heat. It's a funny thing, and and one of the easy ways you can kind of miss what's happening is that it when you when you when you go wide open throttle and you hit like full power and you get into that state you're creating all this extra heat but heat doesn't immediately move from one location to the next it doesn't immediately move from the engine into the cooling system you know it's it's not like you do one full throttle pull and then you immediately overheat the car well, hopefully no. not. I mean, hopefully it, it takes a little bit more than that. Yeah. But it's because it, there's there's this this lag. You have to right. heat, there's it's a, a heat capacity. Sink. Like I said earlier, it's a heat yep. sink, and the whole engine bay is a heat heat yep. sink, and it's all getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And I've but it progresses. I've had, yeah, I've had failure. You won't believe this, but I've had a, an electrical sensor melt on the over by the transmission from oh, wow. the heat coming off of the downpipe in the turbo and that's Shh, like wow. a foot away yeah but the it actually melted well but like when you get those things up to full power and hold it there i mean you 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 see these pictures of the, these cars where the the turbo and the downpipe are glowing cherry red right like you can only imagine how hot that is and how much radiant heat is coming off of that yeah. yes it's a whole yeah. other layer of, of heat management that you have to consider. Like how hot is the exhaust yeah. going to get and how, how much do we have to be able to contain that heat because it yeah. can have this negative effect on other things under the, not only contain it, but get rid of it. Yeah. You got to get rid of that heat. It's got to yeah. go someplace. Um, so, to, so to bring this full circle back to where we started on this Gators theory of how many yeah. horsepower per cylinder you can do, um, that is the key that a lot of people don't get when they go out and they build a really cool car, 500 horsepower STI, and then they go to the track and they can't figure out why they can't go more in 20 or 25 minutes. Yeah. You need to reset your mind. If you're going to go tracking and go for a long time, you're not just going to go out and go do 10 minutes or 15 minutes and do five laps and come off the track. 
It's, yeah. it, it takes a complete reset of your goals in the way you build a car, which also brings up another one of Gator's uh, yeah. <laughs> rules of thumb. And that is if you want, if you think you want to go wheel to wheel racing or just go to track a lot, do a lot of track time, think about the class, well, particularly wheel to wheel racing, think about the class you're going to race in. So go to races, volunteer to be a, uh, a volunteer and do, you know, flagging corner worker, whatever it takes registration, but get involved and find a group of people that you like a kind of racing that you like and watch and learn for maybe you want a whole season mm -hmm. and decide, okay, I want to, I want to race with this bunch of people. I like this style of racing. Mm -hmm. And then pick a class. And then after you decided on a class, that's when you build a car. Yep. If you build a really cool car, like most of us all did, <laughs> me, oh, yeah. me more than once, Yeah. you build a what you think is a really cool car. And you go thinking, you know, I should go race this car. I think I'll try to find a class it'll fit in. Oh, my Lord. You will spend so much money then. Because if one little mod it doesn't seem to make any difference to you yep. in the performance, puts you out of class regs. And now you got to go back and go backwards yep. and demod it. Or you want to keep that mod. Now you got to go up to unlimited. And yeah. unlimited means unlimited money. <laughs> it can. It absolutely can. If you want to yeah. win, yeah, it pretty much does. Yeah. It, well, and 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 it's it. The, the biggest downside to having a mod like that push you into a bigger class is that even if you think, okay, like we, we've had this discussion ourselves for, for various different reasons of like, well, it's going to put us in a limit if we do this, but it just, you know, at least with, where we are coming at is we have a car that is kind of a known quantity and it's like, we're never going to go and, it, you know, we won't be able to like place, but we'll be able to compete. Okay, well, so we can go, we can run the car and all this sort of thing. But if you don't have that piece of the puzzle, you're going to be running up against and looking at these other cars that are are unlimited builds and have way bigger turbos and aero and you name it, everything has, has bigger right. everything. And then and then the real trap that you can get into is to say, well, I did this already and it put me in into unlimited. I just want to see what the car is going to do. But these guys have this and this. Okay, well, if I'm going to go out there anyway, I should add those two things to like bigger arrow, yeah. giant wing, front splitter. So Sequential at least, shifter. Yeah, because then at least at least I will have a chance. You know, it's it's I'm not just going out there for for the fun of it. Right. I'll actually have a chance. But then you're you're adding even more variables, kind of back to the point of like one thing at a time and do do the testing. And then like this is the the recipe for for frustration is that. You, you maybe even just do one other big mod to try and like make it a little bit more competitive, give yourself a chance to be competitive in this bigger class. And then you're, you're introducing a whole nother set of issues that you find out, you know, on day one or day two. And right yeah, when everything is, is melting down and not working properly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So that's my two rules of thumb that we've gone right. through. I, I wanted to get into yes. the podcast. I, and uh, very good. Uh, very good to get those out there. I wanted to ask you about the oiling system because we talked a lot about the cooling system. We've talked about cooling. Right. I imagine that cooling of the oiling system is one of the things that you've considered, but I think I, at least this, the sense that I get is the oiling system is another part of the function of the car that is one of your key considerations as you're, as you're building the car to do this, sure. this kind of racing. Yeah, absolutely. And pretty much I've, I, I came to the conclusion that if you're going to race a car, you got to do what everybody else that professionally races does. And that's use a dry sump system. Um, yeah. Although I'm going to, I'm going to give IAG a plug here. I think their new competition wet sump system would probably work for most race cars that don't have ginormous aero and don't have ginormous tires because you can successfully race wet sump systems. But when you start getting up there and the, you know, I've got a 500 horsepower and I've got a big wing and I've got a big splitter, you, you're basically in dry trunk, dry yeah. sump land. Yeah, no I, doubt about it. 
I, I think the, the best proof of that concept is uh, Mike Omick's car uh, that, that is running, uh, supported by Turning Concepts. And I had a long conversation with Tony uh, when he was out here. And, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put a link in the description. You guys can go back and watch the conversation because that, that car is still dry sumped. I'm sorry, is still wet sumped. Mm -hmm. And they've done a lot of work to it with pan and baffle and stuff like that to get it to the point where it's, it's reliable for what they're doing. Can be done. I would say that the key piece of the puzzle there is data. Like it's right. absolutely you, you can't guess or hope that the oiling system is working. You you can hope. You can and you can guess, but like that doesn't really amount to anything. And if you don't really have the information of what is actually happening with the oiling system, you can't really measure or 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 have a sense of is is the engine getting proper oiling. And, and for what percentage of time on the track. Right. I and, agree. I, in fact, that was going to be one of my other things to talk about was, was data acquisition. Yeah. And you've got to have a sensor on all these things. You yeah. need, a, you need a, a sensor in the diff. You need a sensor in the trans. You need a, uh, sensors on the oil, the coolant, uh, oil pressure. And if you're trying to watch an oil pressure gauge at the same time, you're six inches away from a BMW M3, yeah. you know, going 80 miles an hour around a high speed corner next to each other. Yeah. I guarantee you're not looking at the oil pressure gauge. No. no. <laughs> well, and if you are, you're, you've already had the failure or you're going off. Yeah. 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 You're, you're in the dirt at that point. So uh, absolutely having um, aim or one of the other ones that's, it's constantly logging your data and has alarms on it. Yeah. So uh, all, all the cars we're doing now, both the BRZ and the 818, they, they're, well, the 818 already has a PDM, the AIM PDM mm -hmm. system for the electric, like, you know, to a power module, yeah. but it's got the full uh, display too. And the display's got alarms. And so if any of these things go outside of the normal, I get an alarm and tells me oil pressure alarm, oil temperature alarm, oil coolant alarm, because otherwise, if you're trying to watch a gauge, yeah, let's see, I melted the very first race car I ever owned was an Acura Integra that I bought on racingjunk.com. Okay. It was the cheapest racing car in North America for $2,000 available. Okay. I bought it, I raced it, and I melted the engine when I took a rock through the radiator at Spokane. Oh. And yeah. I noticed my lap times were dropping and I looked over at the temperature gauge and it was completely pegged. Oh, I actually melted the timing covers. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we've, we did that. Yeah. We, uh, we dropped all of our coolant qualifying at Pikes Peak one year, but didn't know it because it was at the corner right before the start. And it just like went around the corner and just the water slushed out. And so we drove four miles with no coolant. And yeah, it was like a blowtorch went through the cylinder heads. It's a oh. lot of a lot of melted stuff. Doesn't we, we all long. learn the hard way, don't we? <laughs> yes, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. Um, what? Well, let's see. When did when did you start really using using data? Was it something that you just always grabbed the data that you had available, or did you? When did you realize that data was really important? So the original LGT race car that Phoenix Performance built came with an AIM Pixel in it. You okay. Know? And that was, and that was my first like world of using data um the sti doesn't have a bunch of data it's got a lot of gauges in it to tell okay. you the truth um, but the, the 818 is all data i also have a palatov d4 you'll have to look it up if you don't know what it is mm -hmm. uh, it it also has an aim mxm in it and then the uh they went the the brz which is going to be my probable last race car Okay. It's going to have data on everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to put the PDM in it. Well, not the PDM. We'll, we'll put an AIM in it. Because of rules, I can't put a PDM in it. It has to use the factory OEM electrical right. harness. But we are definitely, we're going to log every single thing that can be logged. And you go, if you don't get an alarm, you still pull the data at the end of the, of the day and look through it and see what's going on. Yeah. 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 It's, there's been a, PDM uh, is, is power distribution module. And this is right. something that has become like available to let's say mere mortals in like the last five or six years, five, right. seven years. 
And so that's a big game changer as far as you know what you can do with your electrical system. It takes it takes the fuse box out of it. You, you, right. you now have, you know, and a much, whole bunch of relays too. Right. You have yeah. much better, more visible control over the electrical system, but then also lets you add in, and especially when you go with the standalone, you can add in all these sensors. And so, so getting data is much better. And some of the guys with the uh, with the new BRZs that are that are monitoring oil pressure and figuring that they're they're finding ways to actually um, this actually might be relevant to your BRZ is uh, they're they're taking the sensors they're putting them into the CAN bus and then mm-hmm. they're able to read them out of the CAN bus so they're right uh, they're, they're utilizing cool. the factory wiring on on both ends but they're they're kind of adding and subtract or adding and removing the data that they're putting in there because they want to monitor it. Cool. So like now that that's now that that's becoming more and more possible, data and, and the ability to get this information is more possible than it's ever been. And that's where like getting the information, like seeing what is happening with your oiling system or your cooling system, your coolant temperatures, oil temperatures, you've got we have better ability to do that now than ever before. And it's it's going to be such a huge tool for anybody that really wants to to really improve their reliability. I agree. Yeah. Any, any PDM that's got a display function on it and a logging function yeah, is what you want. Not yeah. just the PDM, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's nice to be able to get rid of all that electrical stuff, but boy, toss yeah. in on, toss in a display and a logger on it too. In fact, yeah. in the 818, we have a, a link ECU that's doing its own logging on all the engine parameters. And then I've got the aim logging on all the other stuff. Okay. Yeah. It's, you know, just, I guess, to, to wrap up with the, the oiling system, I mean, now we, we just put a standalone in our in our car with the dry sump. And so to be able to go out to a track and log the oil pressure and just see exactly what's happening everywhere under, you know, for the for an entire, we, we can actually log, yeah. I think, an entire 20 minute session or something. I'm, I'm sure that once you get into like an hour or so, you probably start running into limits of memory. Um, mm, no. No. Okay. No. <laughs> the sorting of that would be a little bit challenging, uh, maybe. But um, to be able to log in, just know and see what happens, and especially when there's a when there's a discrepancy or an error, to be able to like go in and actually look at all the conditions, okay. see all that. Yeah. Well, when you can, especially when you can compare G forces to oil pressures, that's when it gets really cool. Sure. So you look on the graph, you've got an oil pressure drop. Well, where was that? Oh, that was turn three. And look, every time I went through turn three, I had an oil pressure drop or a fuel pressure drop. I had that problem with my 818. We put a, a you know, fuel safe te- mm-hmm. cell in there. And uh, I ordered it with the center back uh, fuel in you know, box, okay. fuel box. Well, center back isn't center back once you turn the fuel cell sideways and put it in the car where the passenger oh, seat not. used to be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so right. every time I went around a left corner at Portland International, after about um, half a tank or less, engine died. Engine oh, died. Man. It was like, oh, God. Yeah. And you look into the aim data and there it is. Every time you go around a left turn, fuel pressure goes to nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So it's, Developing the car that way, I mean, it's just now now that we have the ability to do it, uh, I'm sure like like you're saying with the BRZ, you've got this picture, you've got these these tools that you now know, even just for evaluating the car, that are right. so much more useful now that you know how to use them and what you're looking for. Yeah, and, and tire temps, where you get the infrared tire temps across the mm-hmm. face of the tire, I think that's going to be a game changer for the people who can afford it. This is this is something that's on the car. So it's it's the cameras that are watching the tire on the car. Yeah, the little, yeah. you put a, an array of infrared cameras in the wheel well watching the tires, and in real time, it's telling you how hot the tire is getting in which part of the tire. But that's well, I, that's not a reliability thing. That's just to make your car go faster thing and not burn up as many tires. Sure, but I mean that's a, that's a key piece of information. Why why yeah. we. Why would you say it's a game changer? What what would you what would you do with that information? Well, you know, the classic is you pull into the hot pits, a crew member jumps out and takes your tire temps across the face of each tire. And by the time you get to the fourth tire, it's cooled off a lot already. It cooled off as you drove into the pits, all that stuff. This is real time. This is what, as you go around the corner, you get a temperature uh, display 
and recorded. And so you know at the height of cornering G's what every tire is doing, how much right. grip it's having to deal with and how much uh, how overheated or underheated it is. And you can optimize that then Use by that changing play. your suspension around. Yeah. It's no more That's guessing. I think I need two more clicks here and a, another half a degree of camber there. I better turn the toe out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, you can look and see on the tire temperature, pretty much narrow that way down. What's going on? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know what? As we're as we're winding down here, because I don't want to take too much of your of your afternoon up. Um, oh, that's good. You mentioned you mentioned consumables and and just the cost of endurance racing. Can you talk? Because this is this is a um, consumables is something that I think is also like this blind spot or can be uh, when, when people are building a car because you think about well, I want the, I want the biggest tires that I can get. I want I want you know like some kind of brake system or I just, I want these brake pads or whatever you can get these things. You can think you have an idea of what is going to be the best, but then you put them on the car and then you run the car and you find out, well, wait a minute. Like I'm having to replace this, like, like brake pads are one of the big ones that we realized a little while ago. You're, you're replacing these brake pads often and you realize, well, wait, there's, there's something called an endurance brake caliper that holds a pad. That's like over twice as thick is the stock pans and Why you can you... pull and you can change it in about a minute right because it's designed to be fast <laughs> it's change, designed yeah. to be fast change yeah yeah uh yes it's so this kind of i, I want to talk about brake pads and brakes and what also goes in with this is the data logging is you don't have to spend a ton a ton of money to do data logging on your brakes you mm -hmm. buy those little willwood stickers yeah and stick them on the on the caliper and then you get the Genesis uh, paint and put that on the rotor. And that'll tell you everything you need to know about how hot your brakes are getting. Yeah. You know how hot the, the, the calipers are, you know how hot the, the rotor gets. And then now you've got some good data to say, well, maybe I don't really need to spend $60 a bottle on my brake fluid because it really doesn't even get that hot anyway. Mm. Um, so you can save some money there and just mm. buy the regular old, normal racing brake fluids um, yeah and if you're having problems that it, it helps to understand what's going on or i make this change to my brake ducts did it make any difference look yeah. at your little sticker and see or look yeah. at the paint on your rotor and see and that stuff is cheap yeah really cheap it, it, it's it's, a, it's yeah the rotor paint it's like it's it's like a color uh, you brush it Changing. on the rotor and then it, it'll turn, yeah. I think usually they go from whatever, like a, say it's a red. And once it gets to a certain temperature, it turns white. So like if it, yeah, if it, it goes through a range of temperatures, you can tell okay. what range is actually operating in depending yeah. on the color it changes. And the Willwood, the little Willwood uh, caliper oh, temperature, it's, it's a yeah. gauge and it goes yeah. up and down and you can put a mark, take a um, permanent pen, mark where it is. So you don't forget. And okay. then go out there, run around the track, come in and look at it. And is if it's above that mark, well, whatever it is you did to cool your brakes more didn't work. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And then I'm guessing just like the endurance and motorsports components there. I mean, the, the life that you get out of those components is going to be different than if you wouldn't put on a motorsports brake kit or uh, yes. these like probably tires. Tires is a big consumable that you've got to factor in, especially when you're going for yes. that longer duration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's did all. And a lot of that's also governed by rules. Mm. So, I mean, if you're in the unlimited class, it's not. But in any other class where there are some rules, you know, you can't just go slap AP racing brakes in a T4 car. It's illegal. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, did you ever do anything with fueling? Because I'm guessing that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so oh, yeah. I mean, you have. <laughs> are you limited by tank size? Like, or can you put in a large tank or would you want it all, to? It all depends on which class you're talking about here. Okay. So in T4, you can put a fuel cell in, but it can't, it has to be no more than 12 gallons. Mo nobody hardly does it. They just use the OEM tanks. Okay. Um, you can't put in a, uh, like a radium uh, fuel swirl pot or anything mm -hmm. like that. That's all illegal. But of course in the STI, I got all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then, and in the factory five, eight, one, eight, I've got, you know, all that stuff. 
because you have to. When you're getting, yeah, you can. Tuned, <laughs> sure. Well, and when you're getting tuned, do do you have like different maps? Like, do you have an economy map? Like, where like if you're trying to really go out there and, and do longer stints versus go for maximum speed, right. do you have different mapping for that, or do you just kind of change your driving style? I do have different maps. I have uh, I have. And, and there are some rules that won't let you have access to those maps while you're racing. It has to be okay. done while you're in the paddock. So for instance, the STI, I have um, four or five maps on that one. And I can go everywhere from 300 horsepower to 475 horsepower. Hmm. Now, if I really need to qualify bad, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm not in a class that, that limits horsepower to weight ratio, Maybe I'll slap on the, the, you know, the 110 octane map mm-hmm. and go out there and try to get one fast lap before I melt everything. And then would you be able to then switch the map down from that after qualifying yeah. or do you, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. You definitely got to race like that. So okay. yeah, yeah. Put it back to the, the regular endurance map. But that's okay. just to get you towards the front of the pack at the start. Sure. Yeah. Get you, get you the right foot out the door. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, uh, multiple maps is good. You just have to make sure you're not violating some rules in whatever sure. class you're in. Yeah. And there's, I'm sure there's a safety component to that too, but yeah, it's good advice there. And read the rule book and then go back and read the rule book again. Like it's always a good 10 place more to times. Start. Yeah. And before you make a mod, go read the rule book again. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, to that, it just made me think of this. Uh, as far as engine build and the build of the car, are there any details that you er, that you learned were important for like like when you've had an engine failure and you find out what's failed? Okay, well the next engine that's going in is going to have this or that that maybe you wouldn't have expected, especially at the power level that you were generally running the car at, but th- that you realized was an actual important component to the build to to keep the reliability up. Well, if you're going over stock horsepower, that's the basic start part, right? Okay. And yeah. the more you go over stock horsepower, the more forged stuff you have to have. And the sure. more, you know, uh, head gaskets and all the stuff you got to go to, porting on the cylinder heads and all those things to get to, A, to get to the power and B, to make it more reliable with mm. the right kind of valve springs and you know, all that stuff that goes on, all all the expense that goes along with those things. So yes, there's, okay. And that's just every time you go up a little bit more in horsepower, the more stuff you got to do to make sure it's going to be okay. And the more cooling you got to do. And back when I was talking about how you got to cool everything, you know, is there anybody out there that's still running a turbo without coolant going through the cartridge? Ooh, uh, Does anybody buy a, a turbo and put it on there and say, I don't really need to put a coolant I, on that? I think it happens every now and again, but not not a lot. Not much days. anymore. When I first yeah. started, there was people who didn't think it was yeah. necessary. It's, hey, it's got oil going through it. That's enough, right? right. Um, uh, your external wastegate. Uh, has the TL coolant. has the ability to run coolant through it. Plumb it. Yeah. There's don't a reason. Just, there's a reason and maybe you can get away with it in a drag race, but you won't in an endurance race. You've got to cool that external wastegate. Yeah. Um, there's a I, few other it, things like that. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are for, for engine building or for, for, for specking out a build of an engine for like going over spec. So there's, there's a, there's a, there's an idea out there and, and we run into it, you know, not infrequently where somebody figures, okay, so I have, I have a car. I'm going to put an engine in it. I want to make 400 horsepower, but I'm going to buy an engine and pick all the components based on an engine that's designed to hold eight or 900 horsepower. But the idea is, okay, well, if I'm, if I've got a 900 horsepower capable engine and I'm only going to make, make 400 horsepower, it should basically be bomb proof and now last forever. Did you, Did you run into any of that line of thinking? Oh, I, or, I, I, oh yeah, I, I thought that too. Okay, I mean, okay. Who hasn't? Thinking, sure. I'll, just, I'll just get it. I'm, I'm going to race it at 375, so I should get a 750 horsepower engine. Right. Well, A, you're just wasting a whole ton of money that you should have been putting into heat management and the rest of the car. You know, yeah. exhaust wraps and header wraps and all that kind of stuff. And 
putting uh, some kind of protection around every electrical thing that could possibly get warm oh, from yeah. the exhaust, all that stuff, you, you just spend a whole bunch of money for no reason, actually. And, you know, yeah. there's, all, there's been an argument for a long time about closed decks not cooling as well as, in, as the old open decks or the semi-closed decks. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got closed decks and I don't have any problem with engine coolant so anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's a valid argument not to have a closed deck and just being able to hold those cylinders stable, I think is worth the closed deck. Yeah. But I, I don't see the whole point of going up to like the O-ring head heads and all that stuff. If you're only going to run 400 and 450 horsepower, if you're running more than four, four, 400, 450, well, you're either drag racing or you're time attacking. Mm. So you don't, nobody's going to endurance race at those powers not not for very long sure it's just yeah. everything melts <laughs> yeah the, the cooling system requirements for for going that far above and beyond with the, the, the displacement of the number of cylinders as you said towards the beginning yeah. it just becomes it becomes a, a greater and greater challenge and that and you've got to keep the engine compartment you've got to get air going through there and um well it kind of brings up that a lot of guys are doing flat bottoms Mm -hmm. I flat bottomed mm -hmm. the STI and that actually increased my heat problem quite a bit. Now, I'm not convinced yet that flat mm -hmm. bottoming that car was worth the uh, arrow of effect versus how much more heat I have to trap heat I have to deal with. Right. And yeah. the reliability that causes. So I would recommend, unless you are really on the tip of the spear, running unlimited you'd not flat bottom your car just because you think it's going to be a little bit better arrow because of because of the the heat because management of the from heat. the engine bay the heat now you've got all that heat it's it's trapped up there by the transmission it's trapped uh underneath oh, the yeah. engine it's trapped all the way back even the differential gets hotter when you put a flat bottom in sure so it i don't think it's really worth it at this point Unless that's, you've done just everything else. And that's yeah. the only thing that's keeping you from being top of the podium is that the other guys have got flat bottoms and you don't. I'll tell you what, flat bottom and arrow is one of those things where if you're, if you're just overshooting or overreaching your class, that's one of those, like those, those little gotchas that, yeah. uh, that just seems like, oh, I'll just put a flat bottom on it. I'll, I'll have better arrow. The car will be slipperier. If I'm not making the power, I'll have the arrow to make up for it a little bit more. It's, that's a perfect example of what you know you think it's a simple small choice but it's actually a big complicated choice yeah and if you look at the bot the factory where they put all those panels down there under there now mm -hmm. those do a pretty good job of smoothing out the airflow just themselves smooth enough yeah and they and the reason they did it the way they did it is so they can get rid of just the factory heat much less right. an overbuilt modded out engine heat i remember once it was, it was right when the new NSX first came out. Uh, we were able to get one up on a lift and look around uh, for reasons which aren't worth going into. But the amount of ducting underneath that car um, and the number of radiators that it had, I think it had it was something like 12 radiators or something along those lines. Oh, and yeah. it, it was a flat bottom, but it had all of this ducting to feed all of these radiators. And, oh, yeah, that's the transmission cooler. That's the differential cooler. Here's here's these extra, like, feeds for the radiators and all the sorts of stuff. You see what the yeah, factory is doing. Mid-engine cars are much harder to keep cool. Yeah. Yeah, for, for takes sure. It a lot more engineering to keep them cool. Yeah, well, and you see what the factory does with, a, you know, a modest, well, mid-power car, like for these days, 565 horsepower, whatever, is kind of, you know, it's not crazy, but it's not, you know, supercar territory any longer but you see just what they were going through to design and control the airflow of going going into and coming out of that car it's like okay well just putting on a flat bottom onto a, onto your car without considering ducting or, or cooling and like that i mean it's you can see where there's there's this piece of the puzzle that's missing yeah and very few of us have the engineering skills to fix that <laughs> right <laughs> you know and, what we're doing before we even put it on there and even the engineers yeah. do it on put it on there and they realize they were wrong yeah I mean, it can get the best of us for sure. Yeah. All right. So back a little bit yeah. about the dry sump thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did uh, with the legacy GT wagon was I put the dry sump tank in the passenger compartment with mm -hmm. me. Don't do that. It gets hot. <laughs> it 
it's like having a pizza oven door open and right on you. Um, yeah. I don't care what you do. It's either got to go in the trunk or it's got to be up front in the end with the engine, but don't mm-hmm. put it in the, the don't put yeah. it in the passenger compartment. What's what's uh, for everybody that's listening towards the end. The interesting other factor of that is that the line size, the feed line size from the tank to the pump varies depending on the location. So you, it's much right. easier to put the pump closer, uh, sorry, put the tank closer to the pump because you don't need as much line size. But if you're going to have the tank all the way in the trunk, you need a much bigger line because there's much more volume and time that it takes to get the oil both to the tank and then from the tank to the pump. There's right. It's more critical on the drain back because that's just under gravity um, than it is on the, with the pump pumping it back there. Yeah. So you can go with like an AN12 pushing it back, mm-hmm. but you need a 16 coming back yeah. from the tank to the, yeah. to the feed, to the whatever it is, however it is you're feeding it. Yeah. It's yeah. The, the dry sump. It's um, it, it's, I feel like it's gotten a bad rap because of the expense because, and because of the complexity. Mm-hmm. And I think I've talked about this on here a time or two, but um, there's a lot of guys that went to the dry sump systems and then had trouble because it's not, we, we, it, this happened to us, you know, it, it seems like it should be simple. It's big tank line to line from, you got the pump on the engine done. Like, it seems like it should be simple and it's not, there's, there's, there's complicated choices to be made there. Okay. And so, you know, you get the folks that put things on, don't realize some of the extra complexities like us. And then now, now they have us. other issues. Not just all you, it's all of us. Yeah. <laughs> I bet I've got five iterations of dry sumps and, in boxes oh, in my garage that I'm going to wow. be putting on my eBay. For okay. Sale. Okay. I got, I got to get rid of some of this stuff. Yeah. But it's when, once you get it on there, it does work and it works really, really well. And, and yeah. especially now that we're collecting data, the reliability, the consistency is that is the biggest game changer as far as the pressure going into the engine. You just, you right. know what you're getting is it's whereas, whereas with the, even a wet sump with like all of the mitigating factors you can throw at it. It's there's going to be more variance and fluctuation. Right. And, and the longer they're going to be running the car, I mean, especially from an endurance racing standpoint, I mean, if you're running an eight hour event, you're probably putting as much track time on the car in one event as most people put on in the entire life of the car. Yeah. Or, yeah, or, for a time attack or close car, to it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. like to be able to have consistent oil pressure for that duration, is just so so critical and temperature oil and temperature. temperature yeah you've got to get the tempers down the guys running 270 degrees Mm-mm. yeah well yeah nascar runs 270 degrees but they rebuild their engine every weekend yeah it goes a couple hundred miles yeah 500 but yeah yeah well it depends if they finish yeah 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 um but yeah the, the other the other thing that i will just throw out there with the dry sump where I think is overlooked is the fact that it replaces the PCV system um, because yes. the PCV system in and of itself is troublesome, can be troublesome. Mm, no, just oh is yeah. troublesome. And, and, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with a wet sump system and you're trying to put on these mitigating factors, then you're also going to be dealing with the PCV system and putting right. on mitigating factors like aerial separator, catch can, catch can yep. and aerial separator, multiple aerial separators, depending to try and contain and control the issues that the PCV system also presents. But the dry sump with its scavenge pumps gives you, it eliminates a lot of that complexity and gives you a simpler system that you can control and configure so that you're, you, you don't have a lot of those problems, yeah. which is, that's the other argument. The other argument that I would make for the dry sump, just it, it, it takes away this really big, problem area that's maybe not fully appreciated as much as it should be. And then you get into different versions of how to do the dry sump. It's yeah. not like a, the ones I have are scavenge only. Mm. And I still use the OEM georotor pump for mm-hmm. oil engine oil pressure. But then you got like the uh, RCM and daily where they provide both. Mm-hmm. So you've replaced the, the original OEM pump. So there, there's just a, there's a whole host of complexities there to think about because when you go with the RCM or the daily, now you can't use any of the normal headers. You got to get a special mm-hmm. header to fit around the things. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, the RCM so. one, 
the unequal length header is clear, and they have now a second one. Uh, they oh. have a new one that will clear their pump. That's because their RCM pump sits below the, the engine girdle. The daily pump sits on top, I think, still. But no, the have, daily's on the bottom. Yeah. Daily's on the bottom, too. Okay. Yeah. There's a Maybe it's the Magnus that sits on top. So that yeah. you have more options for, for the pan, uh, more options for yeah, the pan and the headers. But then now you have the pump on top of the engine. So there's uh, other things to consider there. Right. It's right. it's complex, but there's there's the benefits outweigh the complexities, I would say, most of the time. Yeah, especially if you're factoring in the cost of an engine rebuild. So like making sure that you're getting reliable oil to get maximum use out of an engine versus not or not having a clue. It's it's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see. I want to... I, I, I definitely want to let you go because we're, we're winding down towards the end of our time here. But I want to ask maybe for, for one or two pieces of advice, like if not even for an endurance race car, but like if you, if somebody came up to you in the paddock and was like, Hey, I have a Subaru. I, I, I love my Subaru. I want to go road racing it. What are, what are like one or two things that you would recommend to somebody consider to make sure that they're going to have the best experience and to keep the car as reliable as possible. So let's assume somebody's walked with me and said, I want to do an HPDE day. Sure. And I want to take my street car out there and run around. What do I need yeah. to do? Brake pads and brake fluid. Mm-hmm. Okay. You don't have to spend a fortune on this, you know, SRF or something like that, but get racing brake fluid because most people haven't changed ever their True. brake fluid. Yeah. And so here's a guy with a, a 2007 WRX. He's never changed the brake fluid in the life of the car and he wants to go out on the track. Yeah. And as I'm an instructor at Oregon Raceway Park, if I mm-hmm. talk to a guy and he says he hasn't changed his brake fluid, I probably won't even go out with him. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm not going to, I tell these people, I don't care how fast you go. I just care that you can stop. Yeah. I, I, I care how fast you stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's probably the main thing is brake is, is really good track pads and do the brake fluid. After that, the rest of it is just, you know, what you want to spend your money on. But that's my, that's my bottom line is you got to do that. I used to actually, I almost started carrying a brake fluid tester, you know, the one you stick mm. into the, and, and, and yeah. before I would go out in a car and say, okay, uh, well, your, your brake fluid is like the wet boiling points, 275 degrees. Right. This is not going to work. Right. right. <laughs> Man, that makes a lot of sense. And the, and the reason the reasoning there is because it's so easy, even on a completely stock unmodified car, to get the heat in the brake system up to a point where it is just the normal the normal yeah. fluid, the normal pads are just not designed to go. Yeah. And then you're going to have problems. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So so stopping is really important. It turns out. <laughs> it's way important. Way important. <laughs> Perfect. All the rest of it is just fun. Yes. Stopping yes. is way important. Well, and I tell you, uh, you can't go fast unless you can stop fast. One other thing for the racers out there, and it could be even for just the guys that track their car, is to go around to all the suspension bolts and put witness paint on them. So, oh. you know, at the when you get over at the end of a race, you're going to go back out the next the next race. Everybody goes around nut and bolts their car. Well, you can cut that time and down to one tenth, and be safer if you've already put the witness paint on every suspension bolt and nut uh, and you can just look at it. And if it's moved, you've got a problem, but it hasn't moved. Well, retorque and it's not going to do any good because nothing's changed anyway. Mm. So just put the, that little line, that orange witness paint on every suspension bolt on the car. So this is, this is like a, a paint that's designed to tell you, has this bolt turned or not? Right. It actually breaks mm-hmm. at the junction. Okay. And if, but there's a visual that you can see that's turned. If it's turned enough, you can, but even if it's just broken, mm. it's started to turn. And all you got to do is see the crack through it and go, well, there's a whole bunch of vibration there, or it's actually turned a little bit. And you can tell right away. It just, it keys you in on it. So you know how to do it. And I, I've lost a suspension bolt. I changed the hub and oh. apparently the hub didn't get torqued right or something. Oh, wow. And I was doing this the eight hour endurance race and the right rear suspension bolt came out and did a really good spin, snapped the CV axle. Oh no. <laughs> wow. 
So yeah, luckily, you, didn't hit the wall. Have you have you seen bolts get loose? I'm I'm guessing you have. Other other than that one, like just yeah. as a well, if, you're, axle, if you're putting that on. Another one is the axle nut, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been at the track probably seven or eight times when some race car's axle nut has come off and then the wheel comes off and goes flying down the track at hundred miles an hour. And the car is spinning out because it's gouging into the asphalt and, you know, tearing just the heck out of the brake system and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And it's just because their axle nut came off. And so I go around, you know, I don't have hubcaps, right? I just, mm -hmm. and when I, whenever I change tires, which is all the time, the yep. last thing I do is look at that axle nut and then there's, there's witness paint on it right through the, you know, where you dimple it. Yeah. I put the witness paint across that and across the outside. And I can tell instantly if that axle nut has started to back off and probably one out of every, maybe three or four hours, one of them started to back off. Wow. It hasn't gotten loose, but it's definitely not to the torque spec anymore. Wow. Okay. That's, I mean, yeah. Witness paint on the axle nut, that, that would be very helpful we've we've actually yeah. usually you'd think that with the uh with like the the staking the dimple, of the nut, yeah the staking yeah that, that you would be able to tell that and it's it's surprising how many times like it did that move i'm not i'm not 100 sure like right yeah so yep. like the paint would to be an indicator because yep. that's with a big the deal witness paint across it oh yeah because if that comes off it really ruins your day you're you're, you're likely to hit a wall yeah and and there's i mean there's a reason that I'll, NASA and all these guys are obsessed with checking wheel bearings. Like one of the things is you get up there and you're checking the wheel for play. That's also going to indicate play in that axle nut, especially yeah. on a Subaru, because that's what, yeah. what holds the tension in the hub all together. So, yeah. and that brings up one last point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I keep a spreadsheet of every time I replace a part, I know how many miles the car has gone and how many hours of racing it's been. Mm. And now that I've been doing this for a while, I got this spreadsheet that's built out over the years and now I can predict failure. So I can, I can look at that and go, it's been X miles or X hours of racing since I last replaced that right front hub. Mm. So I know I got to go in there and do it now because you don't want to wait till it fails because I'll ruin the whole yeah. weekend potentially. Yeah. So, uh, Serve and once, when you race a car long enough and you keep track of every, the brake pads, the brake fluid changes, every change, oil changes, um, every change you do for maintenance or major part, track it in a spreadsheet, date, time, miles, everything. And then you can say, okay, well, before the next season, I got to do this, 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 and this to even yeah. go out the first day. Yeah, it's this is a conversation that we've had behind the scenes a handful of times about service interval because you know it's when you're when you're just going to an HPDE and, and especially for when it's a car that you 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 drive um, and and it's it's not just a, a car that you drive only on track so it's it's harder to get a sense maybe for how much time a component has or exactly how many miles of use it's had it's a little little bit more nebulous but when you have a race car and you have a pretty the ability to have a pretty clear sense of okay this is this is how old this transmission is this is how many miles this is how much hours of use this transmission has had yeah if you if you keep track of things all of a sudden you can have a pretty good and clear sense of everything's fine up until it's not right and then if you get like two indicators of like this is the this is the good window and then this is where you start getting in close to a failure that's a big indicator that like, yeah, you should go in there and replace that instead of just wait for it to fail. Right. I think one of the, one of the biggest mistakes that we all make as we start tracking our cars more and we start thinking, okay, instead of just doing one or two track days a year, I really want to do like a series of events. I want to, I want to do six or eight track sure. days. I want to go to grid life this year. Yeah. That you, you kind of forget that, level of, of attention in, to the to the range of the car and the fact that these components have lifespans. And man, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to go out to an event having a failure like early on or like before it even starts and then you're, you're on the back foot. You're, you're trying to cobble the car together just to get it to, to run it just to turn some laps it's no fun. And it, it really can no. be to a certain extent avoided if you 
have you know, have the ability to compile some kind of a service interval for these critical components and change them out before and, they fail. And that's the best case scenario is if something happens to your car and you can still work on it in the paddock. Well, yeah. There's True. things that can happen to your car and that's it. Your your season's yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And and that's I think that's one of the things that uh that yeah is not uh, not as appreciated as it should be, you know, over here. Um, not easy to do, and it, it's hard to like take a wheel bearing that it seems like it's a perfectly good wheel bearing, and just put another one on there. But sometimes that's the best thing you could possibly do. Well, when I tell people that are thinking about going racing that for every hour you spend on the racetrack, you're going to spend at least eight hours maintaining it before you go to the next race. That yeah. that's a minimum eight sure. hours going through everything. Otherwise you're going to have stuff break at the track and you're going to spend all that money towing the car there yeah. and hotel rooms and meals and all the other stuff that goes along with it. And it's going to be really expensive because you didn't have yeah. that CV axle. You didn't replace that CV axle or you didn't replace that hub or yeah. whatever it is. It went. Yes. And I can think of, God, I had an expansion tank fail on me once. Oh my, yeah. You know why I failed? Because I had an aftermarket uh, radiator cap on top of that expansion tank. And when the hood came down during racing, the hood would bounce just a little bit. Oh no. And it was banging on that cap. Yep. And the next thing I know, the expansion tank failed, cracks. Yep. And then all my coolant comes out all over the racetrack. Okay, here we are running around. You know how hard it is to find a 2005 SDI expansion tank? It, they depending don't, on location, not very many dealers challenge. have yeah. them. No, no. <laughs> it's, it's coming from like regional parts someplace in New Jersey. Yep. yep, for sure. For sure. Man, all right. I got to ask. Yep. I thought of one last question. What is what is sure. the weirdest failure that you have had? Or was it was it the radiator electrolysis? Or was is there something else that stands out in your mind? It's just that no, that really was not strange. weird. That one's actually pretty well known. I mean, okay, okay. It, Everybody that's been racing for a long time with aluminum radiators knows you're not supposed to do that. Okay. You would think. Yeah. <laughs> at least, at least uh, everybody else did, but me. Um, the weirdest one was the baffle in my dry sump pan. The dry sump pans, of course, are very, very shallow. Mm -hmm. And they do that so they could drop V8s down to the ground. And then the, the, the flat four-cylinder boxer guys copied that when they really didn't need to, the dry sump pan could be much deeper. But anyway, the baffle is right up there. Mm -hmm. And it has these tiny little screws, bolts that attach the baffle into the pan. And they're really close to the crank coming around. Okay. And one of those came unscrewed just a little bit. And I don't know when, but the crank came around and sheared off that little tiny bolt head. It's like a M4 or something. Oh, wow. Really small. And then over the course of who knows how long, the oil sloshing around back and forth, push the oil, push that little bolt head up into the head. And then it sloshed around inside the head for a while until it finally found its place between the cam and a bucket. Oh, that's and not when good. it did that, the, the timing belt exploded. Half the cylinders all got top dead center clearance valve interference oh and the whole engine was trashed whoa just so, from, from this little you were able i mean you've got to to know this oh yeah, you we must found have it. found okay oh it was still jammed wow. it was it was the cam and the and the valve were just jammed together still wow <laughs> with that in there so yeah and it's like okay well there, there there's two learning things out of that is it completely ended the argument I've had with people about whether or not the oil actually sloshes up into the heads going around corners. Uh, yep. It definitely does fill the mm -hmm. heads. I don't care what people say that it's not possible. It does. The oil will come out of the, out of the pan, run across and fill your cylinder heads, which okay. is why yep. people run out of oil, not just the pickup. It's, it's, it's way over there in one of the heads and it's right. got, you got to get it evacuated from the head. Hence a dry sump that has, where you put the in the valve covers, you put to the uh, scavenger valve cover, but uh, and that and Loctite everything. Mm. Yeah, there was no spec to Loctite that from Cosworth. I think it was a Cosworth mm. pan, but Loctite everything. Yeah, 
especially when it's going to be hot so that you know that it's going to stay tight. Yeah. I don't care if it's something to hold the sensor to the side of the engine. You've got to put Loctite on it. Yeah. Wow. Solid advice for sure. With it, yeah. Heat, one last vibration. piece of advice. I, okay. I got to give this one. Okay. I got okay. this one from a Trans Am racer, yeah. a famous uh, Trans Am racer in the Northwest. I mean, the, the really fast Trans Am, not TA2, TA. Yeah. He said, Gator, he said, you don't have any solid engine mounts on your, on your engine or your transmission, do you? I said, no, no, it's, no, I've still got like, you know, they're hard urethane, but there's not solid. He goes, well, let me tell you, you put solid engine mounts on any engine. And the next thing you know, you're going to get electrical failures that you cannot figure out what's going on. Uh -oh. And the reason is if you're using OEM sensors for cam sensors, crankshaft sensors, all those sensors that are so important, they're not built for the NVH that a solid mount makes. And you'll get stuff that will happen. It'll either completely fail or it'll fail or give inaccurate readings in a certain RPM range just where the harmonics of that solid mount are going through the engine. And that oh, harmonic wow. makes that sensor freak out. And it's like between 4,500 and 4,700 RPM. Now, you talk about something that's going to drive you insane trying to oh. figure out why your engine doesn't run right between 4,500 and 4,700 RPM. Electrical it's all it's a sensor problem, an electrical that's sensor problem that's due to the fact you put a solid engine mount in there. Oh, man. Yeah. Chasing down intermittent electrical issues is oh. just about <laughs> the worst thing on the planet. Yes. And, and man, if you would know that you were creating it because you're creating this, this specific circumstance that created the failure. Right. Oof, that's rough. Yeah. That's super rough. Yeah. Yeah. So unless you're putting in motorsport grade sensors that are designed to withhandle any kind of vibration, you're still running the Subaru sensors. I would not put in solid engine mounts or wow. transmission mounts. That is a, that is a great piece of advice and it makes tons of sense, but it, it, it's like, it's like the grounding of the, the, the engine block right. and put the sensor there. It's like when you lay it out, it makes sense, but that is like, you wouldn't necessarily think and, about and that. I'm betting in your comments, somebody's going to say, Oh my God. Probably. Oh my yeah. God. I went and changed back to the rubber mount and all my electrical sensor problems went away. <laughs> There's there for most part, I think of late, people have not been so excited about solid engine mounts. But there was a period of time about I don't know, two, three years ago where everybody wanted solid engine mounts for right. some reason. And I I don't I never understood it, still don't, but man, that's the best argument well, I've ever heard. There's a reason like, not to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very sound reason at that. Okay, so brilliant. I think we we beat this horse pretty good. So yes, well, we'll have to wait to the comments, and uh, you know, you guys, if you've got some questions yeah. for 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 Gator, leave them in the comments below. Maybe we'll get you back on and answer some more. Oh, yeah, I'll check them out. But as we're winding it down, if if people want to see what you're up to, see what you're doing, where can they find out about the cars that you're running, what you're up to, that sort of thing? Sure. I've got a YouTube channel, Colonel Red Racing YouTube channel, and I'm also got a Facebook page for Colonel Red Racing, and you can always find me, and I'm linked to it too, James. Hudson. Uh, I'm on track Subies. Um, a couple of them on the BRZ forum and the Facebook. I'm on a pretty much any forum that has something to do with Subarus, uh, right. BRZs, STIs, whatever. Um, I'm there, but in my YouTube nice. channel, that's where I put my racing videos and stuff. I'll, I'll put the YouTube link in the, uh, in the right. uh, description and the Facebook page in the description as well. So people right. can, can make sure you subscribe, follow, see what he's doing, see how he's making these Subarus last longer than then it should be possible to make them do, but there they are. Great. Thanks, yes. John. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for all the information in, in the chat. Really appreciate it. It's good stuff. It's been fun. Yes. And I, I'm a big supporter of your, of your flat iron tuning podcast. I think oh. they're awesome. I watch every single one of them. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Hearing that I, from, from uh, people like yourself, it, it makes a, a world of difference to us. So really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you, James, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks to you all at home for watching or listening. And thanks for your support as always. Until next time, stay tuned to the Flatirons Tuning. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. Once again, we'd like to let you know that your support is what makes this show possible. Be sure to check out our online store at flatironstuning.com for any of your aftermarket or OEM Subaru parts needs. And as always, stay tuned with Flatirons Tuning.